very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I'm Ritu Bharadwaj, and I'm the principal researcher and the team leader with the Climate Change Group at IIED. Uh, and uh, I'm welcoming you on behalf of IAD and ECAD, uh, which, uh, where we are jointly working under an initiative called All Act, and I'll talk slightly a little bit more about it uh, later on. Uh, I am also welcoming you on behalf of UN, High, UN Climate Change High-Level High Champions Group, which has supported us in organizing this event. And just to provide you a quick overview of you know, where we are coming for, especially in terms of the background about how this research took place, uh, as I'm going to share my slide as well, is we have been working on an initiative called All Act, uh, which is Alliance for Locally Led Transformative Action on Loss and Damage. Uh, and this initiative, uh, we, we are focusing on trying to find practical solutions for uh, loss and damage, where we consider that the most insightful experts uh, on tackling loss and damage are the ones which who are already on the front line, trying to um, manage it, confront it, and and trying and helping or supporting the recovery from these impacts. But as we do this uh, in partnership with them, we also try. We are also trying to uncover how these communities or grassroots NGOs or women's organizations are already. Uh, helping address some of these impacts of loss and damage. What are the gaps in some of these responses and how those gaps uh, can be bridged by, uh, by support through social protection program or other development interventions uh, from the government. We also looking at how they can best be delivered and how they can best be financed so that finance reaches uh, to them not after an event, but before that. Uh, so that they can preemptively prepare themselves so that they can better, better cope and recover from them. Uh, in our own efforts so far, we have tried to unpack some of the both economic as well as non-economic loss and damage, particularly related to the mobility pattern, because in our previous research at, across 12 different geographies, which we conducted in partnership with a lot of local NGOs and local uh, grassroots organizations, we found that forced displacement and distress migration was something which was common across these geographies and irrespective of different types of climatic impacts that they were suffering. Uh, and also, it just didn't, you know, these impacts were not just uh, limited to these displacement and migration. It then led to a, a, a series of cascading impacts leading to human rights violation uh, and, and other health impacts. So, what we are will be covering in today's uh, webinar is to introduce a, a toolkit or a methodology that we have developed, which are, we are calling Comprehensive Climate Impact Quantification Technique, or CSIC. And the reason why we, we came out with this methodology is because in, in our past work over the last three, four years, we came out with a lot of case studies uh, supported uh, by the local experts. But we also know that some of these case studies they are like while they they do bring out the issues, uh, but they are not they are not effective enough to bring about the changes in the policy and programming that we really want. And for that, the policymakers need to understand where exactly these impacts are happening. What's what's the level of scale of impact? Who's getting impacted, and so on. So it is important for us to figure out or or help them understand what are the range of these impacts both economic as well as non-economic. So we'll be introducing this methodology to you. We'll also be sharing the finding of a paper where we've tried to quantify the loss and damage being faced by women uh, in, in an area which has been battling with drought, the debt and migration, uh, where we have actually used this, tech to, uh, this toolkit and to share the findings of that. And then finally, we'll move into a panel discussion to understand or unpack the range of practical ways in which uh, these, these loss and damage that the communities are suffering at the front line can be addressed. So with that, I'm just going to quickly take you through this uh, methodology. Now this methodology has four steps to it. Uh, and I'm just going to qu quickly take you through it because we'll be releasing the complete toolkit as well as, um, uh, as, well as tutorials around it. Uh, towards the first week of April. So please be on the lookout for that. 
but the four stages that we typically follow in this tech methodology is to first conduct shared learning dialogues with the community members. And for many of you who may be aware of participatory rural appraisal techniques, we kind of blend those PRA techniques along with shared learning dialogue. Uh, in order to do like transact walk, do seasonal calendars, uh, try to understand that the those like who, because we also know that loss and damage is impacts are not straightforward. It is not like the entire community in a, in a village would be suffering the same level of loss and damage. Dif we've seen from our past experience and from the case studies that the same, same climatic impact affects different community groups within an area differently. And therefore, it is important to find out who is getting impacted, to what scale, and what are the vulnerabilities that make them more uh, that, that make these risks more profound for them. So that's the first stage, which helps us unpack the range of issues, but also identify the different vulnerable groups. And after that, we move into a process where we start understanding the the underlying vulnerabilities of each of those groups in the form of predisposing, precipitating, and protective factor. Uh, and why this is important, because we, you know, when climate is acting as a precipitating factor, to many of those underlying demographic, social, economic uh, factors, it is important to understand how each of those factors impact those different groups differently. And why, why we also wanted to cover the protective factor, because it is the lack of some of these protective factor in the form of social protection uh, program or safety net program that, that either increases or enhances a community's ability to deal with these impacts much effectively, much more effectively, or reduces the ability to withstand those impacts. So, you know, that's why we have combined these three factors together. The third stage of this research was, or this methodology is to quantify then the range of economic as well as non-economic loss and damage based on index-based valuation. And I'll explain it how we have done this uh, under this study. And then final is the solutions pathway because we need to do this in a participatory manner with all the stakeholders involved, right from the community up to the policymakers level. So the fourth stage is equally important because it's not just good to understand the issues, it's also important to understand the solutions for them so that we can act and, and find a, a way in which we, even though some of these loss and damage we keep saying are irreversible, but being irreversible does not mean we don't act on them. We need to be even more proactive in, deal, in, in acting on them and trying to address this in, in whichever way possible. So with that, I'm going to move on to sharing the findings of our research. Uh, and, the, and, and my colleague Mete is going to paste the link to the, to the complete document in the, in the chat box. So you can look at these findings in more detail there. But uh, the title of our uh, finding of our research paper is Women Paying the Cost of Climate Crisis with Their Wombs. Uh, it seems dramatic, but in fact, if you look at the findings of this research, you will see how women are really battling uh, drought, debt, and migration, and how it is really impacting them in a life-altering uh, ways, just because we have not been able to address them uh, at the stage at which it is occurring, and that's leading to a cascading impact or a range of uh, other uh, tertiary or secondary tertiary impacts. So the study area where, which we covered uh, was Dharur and Ambajogai in Bead District in Maharashtra and in India. And again, I'll just say like we, we carried out our shared learning dialogue in these two regions. And what it really helped us do is to understand that when we conduct our the, the second and the third stage of our study, we, exact, we knew that we have to cover two groups of households there because we found that the impact of this climate change was quite different on two different diverse groups within the community. So therefore, we had to cover in our study both migrating as well as non-migrating households. And then we tried to understand the underlying vulnerabilities or the factors that push communities to undertake distress migration. And for that, we followed again, as I mentioned earlier, a predisposing, precipitating, and protective factor approach. Uh, and I'm not going to share all the findings, but just some of the key headlines here. Uh, so if you look at uh, you know, some of these predisposing factors around demographic profile, you see that the migrating household has many much more higher percentage of illiterate, uh, illiterate uh, 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 individuals 
the there's lack of higher education which means that they'll be they'll have limited ability to pursue alternate livelihood option when it when when their natural resource based livelihood gets impacted by climate change now so you can see the 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 level of illiteracy compared to the na national illiteracy average which is around 30% but if you compare the non migrating households even there the illiteracy percentage is quite high but not the same as compared to the migrating households Similarly, in terms of the access to amenities, again, you'll see that the access of migrant households to some of these basic amenities like piped water, pit latrines uh, is quite less and open defecation is still quite prevalent in this society. This is important slide because if you'll see here, the migrating households uh, are the ones which have uh, low, like, and, and majority of them also have, are landless and their land holding is majority of them have less than one acre of land holding uh, and 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 most of that land is unirrigated compared to the average land holding of non-migrating households which is 1.45 acres and around uh, one third of their uh, land is has assured irrigation facilities again if you look at their average monthly income you'll see that the migrating households uh, average income is almost half that of non migrating households uh, and and this slide again is important because here we're talking about the protective factor and this factor because it becomes important because when these when these uh, households are exposed to climatic crisis it is access to some of these social safety net which provides them livelihood security uh, uh, food security or uh, coverage of health and education or even uh, uh, financial safety net in the form of insurance, you'll see, you know, even in the case of non-migrating household, it is not that great, but still it is less compared to that of, uh, uh, like in the, in the case of migrating household, it is much less compared to the non-migrating household. And there are a range of other issues as well, because this access is, is available to them only as long as they are in the native village. When they are migrating to the to their destination sites, then their their access to these uh, these facilities, these safety net gets reduced further or virtually none. Now we have like we've seen the some of the predisposing factor in terms of the access to basic amenities, land holding, uh, the basic average income, and so on, and then their access to protective factors. But how does, what is the, how's climate change acting as a stress multiplier? So we looked at the, the, uh, the average rainfall over the last 30 years or so, and we saw that there's a significant rainfall deficiency in the last 10 years compared to those of the earlier years. So, and what we found as, found that the, the, the basic, the overall quantity of rainfall was decreasing over the years but also the frequency and the and the intensity of these drought impacts had increased in the last 10 years compared to that of the previous 20 years and what impact does it have on their migration pattern if you see that the percentage of migrating households 30 years ago was around 5.42% which is now increased to around 55 or 56% so clearly there is a very strong correlation between the increasing intensity and frequency of drought uh, or rainfall deficit, if we can say, and its impact on the migration migration profile. But that's not the same in case of, you know, of all the households, as we have seen in the previous slides, there's a sizable population within the villages which are not migrating, and they're not mi migrating because of their better predisposing factor, because they have better land facility, they have bigger land holding, they have assured irrigation facilities and so on. So that, so that has a bearing on whether they are undertaking distress migration or not undertaking distress migration. And then we also try to analyze the reason for migration, which is very clear if you see the, the top three reasons for migration is, is drought, the access to lack of access to safety net, uh, and the lack of education or skills uh, to pursue other livelihood options when they are exposed to climatic crisis. Uh, then, you know, so, you know, we talked about women losing their womb to climatic crisis. So how does that really take place? It, uh, so in this slide, I've just tried to show what is that cycle of climate migration 
and then that bondage that then leads them to pursuing that life altering decision uh, that leads to uh, hysterectomy in these women. So firstly, if you see that drought and that typically pushes the households to, to look for alternate livelihood options. And typically at the start of the, the sugarcane harvesting season, the sugar mills, tip, they approach mukaddams. Mukaddams are, uh, are the middlemen or the labor contractor. These labor con contractors, when they come to know how much labor they would be needing for sugarcane harvesting, they, they then go to some of these nearby districts which are impacted by, and, and quite often they are very water scarce region as well. And then they, they hire these, these, these labor in the form of jodis or pairs. So it is typically, uh, they are hired as husband wife pairs where husband is engaged in, in, in harvesting the cane, whereas women, are, women engage in tying them in bundle carrying them on their head and then loading them in the trucks that, that then take them to the to the sugar mills. Where so once Mukadam gives them an advance money, these pairs or, or jodis or husband wife pairs, they, they move to the sugarcane field in, in traveling for about 24, 48 hours. They where they stay in, in these locations are like really makeshift arrangement with no toilet, no other basic amenities available to them. And many of times they also migrate along with their children. Now, the you have to understand that the sugarcane industry is like why this uh, penal mechanism that pushes women to undertake hysterectomy is like the way sugar mill or the sugar industry works is they have to complete this entire operation of sugarcane harvesting to its loading, to its reaching the sugar mill in the minimum possible time so that the water content or the moisture content of the sugar cane is not lost and there's more sugar recovery. But what does it mean is that when women are carrying those and each of those bundles weigh around 40 to 50 kg, imagine the amount of weight that these women carry. And many a times because of these physical strain, the menstrual cycle of these women get prolonged much beyond like five to seven typical days that women uh, experience menstrual cycle. They, they get prolonged sometimes to even months long and then they keep losing their blood and many of them suffer an, an, anemia. But every time they take toilet break, they are, uh, they are penalized or they are fined by mukaddams. And that fine is sometimes four times what they earn uh, in, in a normal day's work. And, and each time this fine is imposed on them, it means that the advance that they have taken uh, at the beginning of the, um, of, the, of the season, that does not get uh, that covered. And therefore they, they are in this perpetual cycle of uh, debt bondage with them. Now, so we try to measure what is the loss and damage that these women are typically suffering? And for that, as I said, we are using an index-based calculation. And for that, we've used six quadrants or six uh, elements. One is, you know, it might appear a bit technical to a lot of you, but the way we have explained that in our paper, we have tried to, to, to be relevant to many of the grassroots NGOs so that they understand some of these factors more uh, effectively. So we have covered tangible, intangible, intrinsic, and functional, as well as temporal and spatial domains. Now, very quickly, tangible is something that you can measure or, uh, or see. Intangible is something that you cannot see or feel, but it has uh, a, a profound impact um, uh, on, on, on an individual or a, or a household or at the, uh, at the community level. Intrinsic is something which is inherent. Uh, and inherent, whereas functional is something which is more practical uh, and, and impacts somebody's uh, or an individual's functioning, a day-to-day -day functioning. Um, and in case of, we brought in two additional factors of spatial and temporal, because we know that these impacts don't just occur at the place where climatic impacts are felt, but it also, in case of these migrant workers, it also occurs at the destination site. We covered temporal dimension because we know that these are not one-time impact, but they, these impacts which have happened in the past and they will continue to occur in the future as well. So that's why it was important for us to cover all these six dimensions of climatic impact. 
Now, as I said, we have used a lot of index-based valuation. So first of all, we covered this tangible functional loss and damage index, uh, where we covered the loss of crop index, treasury index, water scarcity index. And if you see the indicators below them, we, we further broke them down into sub-indices so that we could then quantify and also monetize some of these impacts. Uh, uh, because and, and these impacts cover both economic as well as non-economic loss and damage. Now, again, I'm not going to take you through all the, uh, the valuation, but I'm just going to cover some of the headline impacts. Uh, and, and some of them, for example, uh, the crop loss because of the latest, drop, uh, latest drought. Now, you will see that this crop loss, which is economic loss, is more profound in the case of non-migrants compared to migrants. Because you have to go back to the predisposing factor where we said that the, the migrant communities, majority of them are landless. They don't have land. So the economic loss is more profound in the case of non-migrants, which who hold land, who have land holdings. But if you compare that with the number of days of employment loss because of the latest drought, you will see that this impact is more profound in the case of migrant workers because they lose their wage employment, whether it is in the source village or in, uh, and, and that's why they are pushed to undertake distress migration. Now, if you quantify some of these average number of employment days lost because of the latest drought, you'll again see that it is quite substantially, it's quite substantially high in the case of migrant communities compared to the non-migrant group. Now, we also said that we covered the, uh, the water drudgery index, that is the, the, the additional distance that the women and girls have to, um, to walk. And I've not covered all the indicators and data here. You'll find them in the paper. But just look at the amount of, uh, the amount of, amount of money that these households, both migrant and non-migrant groups, have to spend on treating illnesses because of which is caused due to water related drudgery. Now, this is the, the debt. So we also cover, as I mentioned in the, showed in my slides earlier, we also covered the debt index. And if you can see the group two is the non-migrant group and the group one, the, the second uh, bar chart is relates to the migrant group. And you can see it's like 124, all these figures are in, uh, Indian rupees, but if you see, it's 124,000 compared to 45,000, which is like three times higher than that of non-migrants. And majority, like half of that uh, debt is owed to uh, the mukaddams or the sugarcane middleman. And that's what leads them to uh, debt bondage. Now, indebtedness, again, you'll see, in the, in the drought period compared to non-drought period, again, is much higher in the case of migrant workers compared to the non-migrant workers. So as I said, like for each of those tangible and functional, so I showed to you, I showed the, the indexes that we covered initially. I've showed some of the data around that. And you know, in the end of each of those uh, tangible, uh, each of those uh, um, functional, uh, those uh, uh, assessments, we then calculated or tried to quantify the differential impact of both economic and non-economic loss and damage on both the migrant as well as non-migrant group. Now, again, you can see here, like in, in the case of group one, it is much higher compared to group two, even though group two did suffer some of the economic loss and damage. So therefore you see a, a bit of impact there. Uh, again, here we have tried to cover the, uh, the, the uh, different dimension of economic and non-economic loss and damage in terms of human rights index, forced labor index, and gynecological problem index. Uh, again, you know, just for the sake of quantifying, we have further broken down uh, them down into sub-indices. Uh, for example, provision of safety equipment, uh, forced to undertake harmful and dangerous tasks, paid additional wage during day off, or deduction of leave of absence. But here you'll see that for group two and group one, we have done it differently. In the case of group one, which is the migrant group, we have tried to cover it both for the source as well as destination sites. Again, human rights violation index. Again, I'm not going to take you through all of them, 
but just see the, the kind of human rights violation which occurs. For example, lack of privacy during bathing, trespass by strangers, exposure to insect attack, or exposure to heat, sun, or sexual, verbal, or physical abuse by employers, and so on. Then we, we try to unpack some of the gynecological problem indexes. So for example, prolonged or heavy irregular menstrual bleeding, severe menstrual pain, and, and so on. And then we try to quantify. So that was quantification. And then we try to monetize some of these impacts. And you can see like the marked difference between the cost of treating illnesses because of the work environment. Uh, how, like in the case of non-migrant group, it is like close to 20 and which is several times higher in the case of migrant workers, which is around 5,033. Again, we, you know, overall index, uh, if you look at intangible functional loss and damage index, it's like 80 compared to that of 15. Uh, then uh, another index is around loss and loss of organ index and uh, expense due to organ loss index. Uh, here again, I'm not again going to take you through all the, but some of the key factors, if you can see the age at which this hysterectomy was performed, you can see like close to 35% of these women undertook hysterectomy at the at age less than 30. And around 30% took it, uh, undertook those this operation at the age less than uh, 35. Now here it is important to mention that the, uh, that the average age at which hysterectomy is performed in India is 42 years and the average percentage of women undertaking hysterectomy is 3.2 percent. So you can like and in the case of our study area this uh, the average percentage of women undertaking hysterectomy was 55 percent. So there's a marked different uh, difference in in if you compare that with the uh, with the national averages. Then the cost of uh, undertaking hysterectomy, again, you can see is much, much higher in the case of migrant compared to non-migrant because majority of the hysterectomy for the for these migrant workers was performed by them in, in, uh, in private hospitals compared to the government hospitals because purely by the fact that they are moving, they don't have access to government facilities as compared to the non-migrant families. Then what is the impact of these hysterectomy? Like women undertake hysterectomy because they think that they undertaking hysterectomy will get them rid of their menstrual cycle and then they'll not be facing uh, the, the, the penalties which is imposed by those uh, mukaddams. But what happens as a result is they then start experiencing menopausal symptoms. You know, you can see some of those women at the age of 25, 30 years. And and menopausal symptoms is not very simple. It is like it, it, it changes their hormonal balance. They start experiencing joint pain, uh, type of uh, 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 symptoms that a 45, 50 year old woman who's undertaken hysterectomy or undergo undergoing menopause would experience. And they are experiencing it at that age. And I'm not like you can see on the slide if you can read them, some of them are, uh, are like pain, uh, uh, pelvic discomfort, uh, obesity, heart disease, involuntary loss of urine. So these impacts are quite profound on them. Uh, and if you see the, and, and it's not just that, they are also, these women are facing a lot of accident during the, uh, in, in the workplace. And, uh, and because of these accidents, they are also um, uh, have to spend money in treating them. And we have just uh, quantified some of the cost of treating those in uh, the accident injury. Now, because of, uh, we also try to quantify the productive income loss because of permanent disability, because of uh, the accidents during a workplace, Again, we here we have made some assumptions, which is mentioned in the slide there, which is we have assumed that the productive age of a person is 58 years and the uh, uh, physically active or normal person earns around 60,000 rupees per year. Here we have quantified the overall index values, you know, profoundly high for uh, the migrant compared to non-migrant. And this final index uh, is where we are trying to assess the, the health in effects of hysterectomy and the mental health problem index. You can see the num uh, the 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 the, the CEO indicators that we have used. Now amount. So it is not just the one time effect of hysterectomy. Once they have hysterectomy 
And if you see some of the case studies we have covered in the paper, you will see that you know it then hysterectomy is just the start of their problems. They they continue to face uh, joint pain and and the host of other medical problem because of hysterectomy. Because typically, after hysterectomy, these women are supposed to take rest for at least one and a half to two months, but they go to go back to work straight after the operation, which means that they barely get a time to recover. And, and that then creates medical complications for them later on. So I've just we've just quantified the amount of money that they spend on treating the health effects of hysterectomy and the amount of income that they are losing because of these health effects. Again, we have tried to quantify it. You can clearly see it's 214,000 uh, compared to around 70,000 that for non-migrants. And then what are the mental health problems that it creates? It creates, uh, uh, and, and this is based on what those women explained to us, they have a they have a feeling of guilt or worthlessness, suicidal thoughts, sense of isolation, uh, loss of interest in life, persistent sadness, uh, feeling hopeless. So these are the kind of uh, impacts that they explained that they were experiencing because of this. And then we also try to quantify what was the income loss because of these mental health problems um, for these two groups of families uh, and. This is the final index value. Now, overall, after we quantified all the different functional, tangible, uh, intangible, and, and, and other aspects of loss and damage, we try to finally quantify all of the economic and non-economic loss and damage. On the left, you will see uh, the, the total loss and damage that is being suffered by the migrant families. The income, on an average, is around 94,000 but their total loss and damage is around 155,000. Now, if you compare that with the non-economic uh, or non-migrant, it is around, the income is around 50, 151,000 and they're suffering around 80,000 uh, loss and damage. Now, what this shows is that the non-migrants will never come out of this vicious cycle of uh, migration, debt, and this human rights violation, and and all the non-economic and economic loss and damage being suffered by them. Now, I'll just like I'll, before I hand over to Tom for the panel discussion, I just had few points here to mention, and and I'll leave you with some thoughts. Is this research personally was not easy for us? Uh, we uh, we like me and my colleague, if I like Kartikeyan and Nagarajan. Uh, was uh, and and Ira Dulgaukar and Arundhati, all of us, we worked in the field for about 10 months. And it had a profound impact, not on me, uh, but on all of my uh, team members, because when they came back from the field, they felt uh, they were suffering from mental health. I was, when I was writing this paper, I probably cried two, three times because I just couldn't reconcile with the fact that so many women and girls, young girls, age of 14, 15, they are getting married off so that they can work as fair in, in these sugarcane fields. So their, their, their future is almost written uh, at that age. And, and there is no way they can come out of it. We as, we, you know, we as research institutions, we felt that we have some responsibility towards uh, this. And that's why we initially we had thought we'll do uh, this 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 research based on case studies, and that's when we thought that we can't just let some of these invisible impacts just go uh, being unquantified. Because if you don't quantify them, then policymakers don't understand the impact of these their inaction on uh, on supporting these women and girls, and uh, and and therefore there'll be no protective measures uh, for them. And many of these impacts occur because you know if you look at India. There is MGNRDGS program, uh, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which could have provided them wage employment much higher, at a much higher rate than what they earned in the sugarcane mills. But just because of operational issues, just because they couldn't get access to, to these programs, they they had they were forced to undertake migration. And 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 it's not just migration. I'll just leave you with one of the case studies example. Uh, we covered the case study of one of the women who said that she had just because the the penal the pen, the penalty for losing every day of wage was so high 
that within five days of her uh, of her delivering her her daughter, she had to go back to the field uh, and start working. And while she kept the baby on the side because she was feeding the baby, a tractor ran over the baby. And it was it was not just there. She didn't even get one day to mourn over the child and she had to come back to work again. So I'll just leave you with this thought because it is many of these issues are not unsurmountable. The good news is we have solutions for them. Uh, but we we and, and in our paper, we have explained how the newly created loss and damage fund board can address many of these issues, not just in the case of, uh, of these women, but many other communities which are suffering similar invisible non-economic loss and damage in a range of contexts. Uh, we, from our own side, we are trying to quantify in a range of contexts, and we will be sharing the, de 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 the details of those uh, by first week of April. So please be on the lookout um, and see our website. Uh, whether it is loss of biodiversity, loss of cultural heritage, loss of uh, quality of life and so on. But I'll leave you with this thought and I'll pass on to my colleague, uh, Dr. Tom Mitchell, who is the executive director of IID. And he's also a very strong protagonist of uh, looking at practical solutions for loss and damage. So you are in good hands um, uh, going forward with this panel discussion. Over to you, Tom. Ruti, thank you so much. Um... Look, I think I've known about this study for several months now, and I've equally had very small insights into the toll that has taken on the team. But I think I'd like to just echo what you said. This is a kind of hugely shocking um, and a highly complex set of issues, and one that does give a, a particular emotional response. I think that's that's clear. And you, know, you can't help but think, you know, you've already pointed to many ways that there could be protective measures to help support the women that you've been you've been describing but they're not working so let's um let's make sure we can focus our attention on doing all we can to you know, alleviate these sufferings with very practical solutions that you've highlighted and i think in that sense i want to pay um you know huge tribute and respect to the team um that you've had working in the field and producing this research which i think will have and significant implications um, and hopefully will lead to a situation where we can um, support the lives of the women and certainly improve things. But we have um, a wonderful set of panelists today um, who will be reacting to the research, um, will be sharing their own thoughts um, and giving a sense of what their organisations are doing on this topic of climate change and health as well. Um, what I'm not going to do necessarily is spend a lot of time to introduce the panelists separately. Um, we will do that in the chat. So if you want to know more details about the biographies of any individual panelists, please do go to the chat. And we will have a first round of responses to what uh, what panelists have heard from Ritu. And then we will turn it open to the floor. So um, you have the Q&A function that uh, Georgina highlighted at the start please do gather your questions or insights there, and we will do our best to find the time to cover as many of them as possible. So without further ado, let me turn to um, our first panelist, um, Arundhata Patil, who has been certainly part of the research um, and can speak very much to the experience that uh, she had. Arundhati, can you share some specific stories or experiences from the woman in bead? that illustrate the direct impact of the drought induced, um, uh, the, the climate induced drought and debt on their decisions to undergo hysterectomy. Over to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed panel members. And I would like to extend a special welcome to Ritu Bharadwaj, uh, who has presented the study findings that form the backbone of the conversation today. Your insights are invaluable as the navigate through this complex issue. I represent Manaswini Mahila Prakalpa, a women-oriented arm of Manolok, a grassroots empowerment organization. Since 1984, it has been de dedicated to combating violence and discrimination against women operating independently to campaign this cause. Now let's dive in 
and learn about how climate change affects women's health in bead of maharashtra bead are often synonymous with its arid landscape and drought prone terrain the region stands out as the district that contributes the largest labor force to sugarcane field of maharashtra as well as andhra pradesh within the bid district area like bid dharur majalgaon vadwani and many hamlets of the banjara community witness significant migration during each sugarcane harvesting season government statistics reveal that more than 5 lakh individuals migrate from bid alone for 4 to 6 months during the sugarcane harvesting period among these migrants women bear the brunt of laborious task often engaged in various roles within the industry manaswini women's project has been dedicated to addressing the challenges faced by sugarcane laborers particularly women and their children from its inception in the early 90s the agriculture landscape was marked different with migration rate ranging from 10 to 25% in villages our organization provided vital assistance in the form of well digging community infrastructure and agriculture resources such as seeds and fertilizer however over time we observe a disturbing trend of recurring drought and unpaid cattle rainfall in our region significant impacting agriculture productivity with agriculture being the primary source of income and no alternative industrial opportunities available the livelihood of our communities were severely affected this reliance on agriculture for substance led to situation where more than 90% of rural women depend on agriculture wages following the year 2000 the erratic rainfall pattern worsened leading to drought conditions every alternate year further exacerbating the challenges forced faced by our communities as a result many families found themselves unable to sustain themselves solely through local agriculture and turned to seasonal migration to sugar industries in western maharashtra and karnataka today a significant portion of families from rain fed villages ranging from 60 to 80% engage in migration to sugarcane fields the role of women in the migration process is particularly noteworthy in sugarcane cutting a task that requires that involvement of married couple at ground level labor contractor typically from groups comprising 10 to 16 couples entering into year long contract with advance payment this shift in life food pattern underscores the critical importance of understanding the interconnectedness of environmental factors economic realities and gender dynamics in shaping the lives of vulnerable communities sugarcane cutting is an incredible demanding task the families of cane cutters often find themselves residing in makeshift accommodations on the sugar cane farm which often minimal infrastructure these accommodations typically consist of tents or huts constructed from whatever material are available there women in these families bear the responsibility responsibility of managing household chores with limited resources in addition to cooking washing and cleaning they also actively participate in the manual labor of cutting and bundling sugar cane alongside with their partners this labor intensive work often entails carrying heavy bundles of cane on their head to transport them to vehicle unfortunately these working conditions take a toll on their health many women 
experience health issues such as heavy bleeding, vaginal infections, and body ache due to the strenuous nature of work. Moreover, accidents such as falling from vehicles or snake bites are distressing common occurrence in their daily lives. Tragically, incidents of sexual harassment are prevalent among sugarcane laborers. Although they are rarely reported or addressed, having closely worked with these women, I have witnessed firsthand their struggles and heard their cries for help. Regretfully, they often find themselves without any assistance or support in their time of need. This work isn't bound by time constraints. They earn wages ranging from 300 rupees to 364 rupees per ton of sugar cane cut. Consequently, they cannot afford to lose even a single day's work due to health issue. Sadly, they lack access to medical facilities and financial security despite their hard work. Women in particular face the brunt of these challenges, earning major wages compared to their efforts. Moreover, contractors typically provide advance payment into men only, leaving women sugarcane laborers in a precise final position. Faced with such dire circumstances, women contemplate drastic measures as a solution to their financial and health woes. Tragically, many women even consider undergoing hysterectomies to alleviate their hardship. It's crucial to recognize that these extreme decisions are often a result of a compounded challenges they face, exactly by factors such as drought. Without the pressures induced by drought, such drastic measures would not be necessary. In response to these challenges, our organization takes protective step to address the plight of migrants. We organize and mobilize the, these women, empowering them with awareness and knowledge about their rights. Additionally, we provide crucial legal aid service to assist them in navigating through complex legal matters. Recognizing the financial hardship they face, we offer financial assistance to alleviate their immediate needs. Furthermore, we engage in policy advocacy efforts to push for systematic change that safeguard the right and well-being of migrant women. Through these multifaceted efforts, we strive to provide comprehensive support to migrant women, empowering them to assert their rights and improve their living conditions by fostering a supportive environment and advocating by systematic change. We aim to mitigate the need for drastic measures such as undergoing hysterectomies. In conclusion, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to IIED for shedding light on this critical issue and bringing it to the attention to the international community. Your efforts in amplifying the voices of vulnerable women in bead are invaluable in driving meaningful changes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arundhati. Um, really insightful and also elaborating further on the experiences that you have. And thank you to you too for the partnership that we have. Without you, it wouldn't be possible to gather the, the insights that we've been able to gather in this research. So uh, sincere thanks. Let me move on to introduce um, Madeline Thompson from uh, the Wellcome Trust. Madeline, I'm keen to understand from you, well, I suppose your reaction to this research and the findings that you've heard, but also if you could give us some insights into how uh, how you see health research helping to shape the kind of response to loss and damage on the climate change side that would be fabulous over to well, you yeah thank you i mean i think like anybody who's been hearing that um, presentation i mean it's a devastating report on the condition of women um and the impacts of climate and other factors in uh, in their lives and how uh, climate change has really played out on the bodies of women is extraordinary and compelling in terms of 
how our response should focus on the needs of women, particularly vulnerable women, uh, in in these types of situations. And unfortunately, uh, it's you know they're not alone. There are many contexts um, that you can think about where women are on the front line of climate change uh, because of these extremely high vulnerabilities. Uh, so, but uh, congratulations to uh, Ritu and and the team for putting together uh, such a clear, um, not just clearly articulated, but really data informed um, uh, research because um, it is needed. And and one of the things I don't know if the audience are familiar with Welcome, but Welcome is is um, one of the largest uh, global um, health and medical uh, research foundations. Our our core business is research. And um, we have been historically very much uh, a biomedical, a kind of high-end uh, research funder. Uh, but a, a couple of years ago, we had a new strategy that was built. And um, while we still do discovery research, we were very much behind uh, the response to COVID, um, et cetera. Uh, we now have a, um, a very uh, integrated uh, organization uh, that um, maintains discovery research, yes, but has three challenge areas. And those challenge areas include mental health, which is an area that has been really poorly invested in over many years. It includes infectious disease, which we have a very strong track record in uh, globally. And it now includes a climate and health program, which has been functioning for the last two years. And um, and the way we support researchers um, is obviously through funding. Um, we like to see ourselves as more than a funder. Uh, we have a, a large um, influencing team that can get involved in uh, helping to shape the policy environment, helping to shape the funding environment, et cetera. Uh, but primarily for researchers, you know, we provide resources so that they can go and do the really important research um, that is needed. And um, in the climate and health, uh, program, one of our earliest um, funding calls was the to look at biological vulnerability to extreme heat in maternal and child health. And drought and heat go together hand in hand, uh, usually the hottest years and uh, the driest years. Um, and um, uh, again, what we see is that not only um, is the um, uh, women's health and heat very poorly researched relative to other areas. I mean, there's a lot of research that's been done for the military. There's a lot of research that have been done for um, uh, elite athletes, uh, but very little research that has been done that will support women, uh, women's health issues. So we funded um, uh, nine uh, research teams to look at the impact of extreme heat on maternal and child health. And then particular things like uh, delayed labor, early um, preterm birth, et cetera, why this is happening and trying to get a better understanding on how those uh, women could be supported uh, going forward. Um, that call is now up and running, but we have another one that's in development that uh, I think relates as well, because you've highlighted not only is this a physical health issue, but it's a really important mental health issue. And uh, we are in the process of developing a call on uh, the impact of heat on mental health. Uh, and um, uh, this builds on a current engagement uh, with a global dialogue that's been happening over the last year, uh, learning about the experiences of different communities uh, at, the, um, at the interface of climate change and mental health. And, um, uh, you know, again, this, this uh, uh, presentation, I think, is very relevant to that, um, trying to understand what are the um, biological, but also social and, and psychological um, drivers of mental health issues. And then again, what should our response be? So um, I think, first of all, you know, it's an extremely important piece of research um, that, uh, and I, the other piece I think I wanted to pick up actually was uh, Ritu's comment on the mental health impact uh, on the researchers themselves. And um I think that that is a challenge that we have to take on, you know, in many situations, but particularly around climate change, uh, that uh, there is a significant um, impact in terms of looking at uh, situations that feel desperate and unsolvable. And the only, if you like, 
compensation that we can hope for is that we can be part of the solution, that we can drive resources towards uh, those solutions. And by making the impact of climate change on the health of women in these particular contexts and very much doing that with the communities that support those women and identifying the policy opportunities, that is a way that we can see the value of the work that is being done. It's not research for research sake, it's actually research to change what is going on. And um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Madeline, thank you. And, and equally, a big thanks to you and the Wellcome Trust for, I think, for, for, for being courageous in supporting bodies of work and research that haven't been looked at so much before. I know that that takes time, effort and influence and so on, but hugely valuable to be able to look at these under-researched areas and, and great to have you with us. Thank you. Let me just also now turn to um, Jasmine O'Connor um, uh, from Anti-Slavery International. Jasmine, great to have you with us too. And um, my question for you, I suppose, similar to that of Madeline, you, of course, work on the intersection of, of modern slavery and, and climate change and migration and so on. I think we hear in this particular case example, in some ways, a perfect storm of a whole bunch of really tough factors coming together and having an impact on women. How do you see the kind of policy response of being able to tackle such tricky situations where you've got all of these factors um, weaving together? Um, well, firstly, thanks very much for, for inviting me. And, you know, secondly, I, I concur with everyone's comments that this is the most shocking, egregious example of oppression, you know, multiple oppressions, you know, slavery, climate change, the sort of challenge of, of forced unplanned migration playing out on women's women's bodies. Um, and I just kind of want to take a moment to, to just acknowledge uh, the the courageous research that IAED have have done, and to acknowledge the human humanity and the lives that are behind that, behind those uh, big pictures, each and every individual woman, um, and um, women kind, and all sorts of organisations that are working on on women's rights need to be, you know, understanding this and listening to this because I don't think the policy solution can be you know, one or two organisations. It's going to need anti-slavery activists. It's going to need feminist activists. It's going to need climate change activists. It's going to need everyone to come together to to find the kind of solutions that, that we need. So I, I, you know, I hope that this uh, goes far and wide, right across right across uh, civil society uh, and into the hearts of, of governments. I think in terms of the, the, the sort of policy solutions, I think the first thing I would probably say is that the policy solutions when it comes to slavery are are, are woefully inadequate, um, and so you're sort of starting this from from a, a very much a back foot. Um, and when you take India as an example, eleven million people in India are already in some form of of modern slavery, and globally, women account for over half of those in modern slavery already. So out of the sort of fifty um, million in slavery globally. Uh, around 26 million are, are women. And that actually includes forced, forced marriage. And I think it's really important to, you know, again, uh, on, on sort of uh, day before International Women's Day to just state how those intersecting types of slavery play out um, on women across the, across the world. And I think the other bit to add in there is that migrants are three times more likely to, to find themselves in forced labour. So I think putting all of that there, I, I think there's got to be a recognition that as we are bringing together and looking at the right kind of solutions to protect people from slavery, that needs to be layered into the right solutions to protect people in the context of climate change, which is effectively having a multiplier uh, effect on existing vulnerabilities. Uh, and so from our perspective at anti-slavery, that, that's what we're very much focused on. I think the point that I will make on that is that one of the other significant drivers of, of slavery that we need to consider is that really globally, it's, it's disenfranchised groups that are the most vulnerable. That is the one um, you know, common factor. And obviously when you look at, at women, that 
breaks down into women and all those intersectionalities, whether it's caste, whether it's class, whether it's, you know, um, education, whether it's migrant status. And so you put all of that together and it, and it becomes very, very challenging. I think when we are therefore looking at the sort of protective factors, we need to recognise that actually, as it is at the moment, according to Walk Free, only three countries have got social protections that are considered enough to address modern slavery. Um, and so we need to be working and looking at that um, you know, in a really tailored and targeted way because it's, it's not happening within the context of social protection already. Um, those social protections aren't geared up to, to protect. Uh, those that are vulnerable to modern slavery. Um, I think the other thing is to recognise that it needs to be a package of solutions. Um, we can't talk about this work without asking ourselves, you know, why the the sort of sugar cane, cane production and whatever other factories, whatever other agricultural sectors around the world aren't set up in a way that is preventing forced labour in the first place, um, because when you then put migration onto that and drive that vulnerability, you know, forced labour becomes inevitable. And so I do think, you know, that th this has to go hand in hand in terms of ensuring that forced labour uh, is is addressed as people are, are on the move. It's got to be addressed writ large. And I think, you know, adding into that, understanding that those um you know guarantees for people on the move need to include the legal guarantees because i think when you layer in migrant status and discrimination of, of migrants and migrants being able to access decent work very often the sort of irregular um migrant status creates a barrier to, to access. So, I mean, those are sort of some initial thoughts, but over and above uh, all of this, I would say that the only way we're going to get the right solutions is to, to have, you know, the, the right people consulted. And I think the fundamental challenge is that those that are most vulnerable are already disenfranchised and do not have a seat at the table and are not able to, you know, often have their voices heard. And I think that's critically important. And then all of this, of course, has to feed into national adaptation plans. It's got to feed into nationally determined uh, contributions. Uh, and we need to be, be focusing on it you know, in the context of COP, in the context of putting these um, powerful drivers and multiplying impacts of climate change together with what is already you know, a, a crisis point in terms of 50 million people globally in slavery and recognising that if we do not do that, we are looking at quite a challenging future. But there are solutions. There are good practices. Um, and we can uh, hold hold governments and we can hold employers as well to, to account for um, ensuring that uh, these, these, these issues do not reach the sorts of horrific continuation of the horrific levels that they're already at. Thank you. Jasmine, thank you very much for your kind of thoughtful reflections and couldn't agree more that there's a lot of things that we can be doing, but you've also got the impacts of climate change continuing to escalate that adds adds fuel to the fire further. So it right. means we need to kind of double those efforts too. But in some ways, there's a, a fabulous segue to our next panelist as well, because you mentioned the importance of legal protections and uh, and looking at the role of the justice system and so on, including at an international scale for dealing with the impacts of climate change. And we've got Stefan Raubenheimer, a human rights lawyer, who's been turning an increasing focus to using uh, legal measures and, and the justice system to tackle the impacts of climate change. And I wonder, Steph, whether you could equally give your reaction to what you've heard, but also help us understand what role legal tools and the justice system might be able to help us with here in terms of coming up with some of the solutions or, or, or you know, equally giving out some of the penalties that need to be given out in reference to the, the damages that have been caused. Over to you, Steph. Thanks to other panelists for, for being with us. 
thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ritu. And uh, thank you, Arundhati, for what is, I think, probably one of the most extraordinary pieces of research that I've heard in recent times. And also, of course, one of the most heart-wrenching pieces of research. But you're asking me to put the the cold hat of the lawyer on and um and look into this phenomenon that you have uncovered <clears throat> with such rigor by the way that uh, and ask the question can the law help with redress and if so in what way and let me also just quickly say of course that i'm no expert in the domestic law of the country we're dealing with and I'm not giving legal advice here, but I'm speculating um, uh, as to what we could do on a practical level if the law could be useful. Of course, perhaps a good way to start is to say when these kinds of things happen, the law really asks what is the most proximate cause of the damage that has been done in this case to women. Um, and in this case, it is damage that is both um, able to be translated into money and damage which is more of the psychological and non-financial um, kind. Uh, and in that regard, you know, we have a long international tradition of class actions. I did some class actions myself as a, as a young lawyer in South Africa. Uh, where groups of women were um, disadvantaged terribly in one case by um, police burning down their houses and complete loss of um, of their effects. Um, and there we were able to bring thousands of women to court and to claim back those losses from the Minister of Police because of the proximate cause. Now, in this particular case, it strikes me that the most proximate cause are the owners and employers of the industry that hires them under these terms and conditions without accepting any regulation which you would expect in a civilized country in respect of women who have certain disadvantages. They are the child bearers. They need more time or whatever you'd like to say. There is a need for women to to. Uh, work under a, a slightly or more extensively different set of rights and obligations as men do. Um, and this seems to be completely not the case here. This is, as as has been pointed out by Jasmine, slavery, quite simply. There are no rules. You have to work at a terrible pace. And if you if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing, you pay and you fall into debt. And so the cycle gets worse and worse. So the next proximate cause is whether one could take that industry to court. Um, and of course, here there are possibilities, um, but I'm no, no domestic law expert. Um, and certainly I would think that the vast proportion of the loss suffered by these women is more directly attributable to that industry. And that industry is probably part of a very large sugar value chain in the world. So in the same way that we sometimes take supermarkets in France to court for trees that are chopped down in the Amazon, um, we can consider doing the same. So there are multiple opportunities along that value chain for, if not redress, at least legal pressure on the, um, the uh, uh, first most proximate cause of, the, of this damage. The second most proximate cause is, of course, the fact that the government does not regulate this industry. In South Africa, my country, at least there is the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. And we would see, uh, if we did see something of, of this extent and impact, that it would be swarmed over by lawyers who would make use of legislation to, to at least stop or or, or, or uh, deal with the um, failure by government to step in and make sure that the basic social and human rights of women in this particular case are protected. And this is a constitutional regulatory concern that one should do some research 
to match your extraordinary research and see whether um, that is a step uh, that can be taken. I'm being asked then to look at the third most proximate cause, and that is um, the exacerbator, the accelerator, which in this case is drought. And in that regard, so this is now the climate element, um, I'd say that we should explore two avenues, the one being the the avenue of, of litigation and law, and the other one being what I would call a development finance policy avenue, which has a legal element to it. Let me just deal with the first. We've done quite a lot of research into whether people or classes of people um, who are suffering as a result of a, of a climate impact can take their losses to a court for redress. I want to preface by saying this is an extraordinarily complex area, a very new area of law, and an area of law that needs a lot more work and a lot more understanding. To give you an idea, there is one case in the whole world at the moment where an individual is taking in this case, his loss to a uh, court in another country against a company in that other country. So this is a Peruvian taking a case in Germany against a German utility for a nominal amount of money, $15,000, for a loss. And he is trying to show that the act of that German company, amongst all the emitters in the world, is contributing to this glacial melt and uh, and the threat to his income in the little Peruvian village in the Andes. One would have to do the same thing here. You would have to take this class of people with the research that Ritu and her team have done, the quantum of loss, and you would have to go across the border and into the right court in the right country and with the right collection of defendants um, attempt to uh, achieve your loss through a litigation case. However, and I won't be long, Ritu and Tom, um, this is extremely difficult. We, we did this very recently for um, in, in the suburb of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. There was a big storm event. And uh, the loss was three hundred million dollars to P um, rands, rather to to communities who lost houses and all sorts of things. We did the work to see what that quantum was, but then we needed to find out who to take to court. And remember, we are then looking at all the emitters in the world, okay? And we also had to look at whether climate change, that is, human-induced anthropogenic climate change. Um, was a very large part of the signal that gave rise to that weather event. So in this particular case, how much is climate change a signal to the increase in the drought? Now, it's likely that it's a very big signal. Unfortunately, in the Durban case, it was a very small signal, only 14%. So you can imagine if I lost $1,000 in Durban and I took all the emitters in the world to court, I would only get $140 back. And taking all the emitters in the world to court is impossible. So I would take only, say, 10 of the largest companies and only 50% of the world's emissions. And then I would only get half of 14%. And so it was abandoned as a case. And we must be very realistic even in cases like this, and I asked the question in the chat, how many women are affected by this? Is it hundreds of thousands? Thousands? I don't know. But we must be realistic about the difficulties of cases of that nature. Another approach that I thought, and this is my last comment, um, Tom, that might be of interest if the legal route um, related to climate change now, not related to the, to the rights-based uh, domestic approach, if the legal route is is complex and compromised by numbers and money and so on, is there not a route through international law, um, through the International Court of Justice, to put pressure on the fund that is currently in negotiation to deal with this kind of case and also to put pressure on 
the whole development finance system. Because after all, we are talking about one of the advanced economies in the developing world that should be doing much better at this than it is clearly doing. And the cost of that regulation, the cost of the technologies of growing something better than sugarcane in an increasing drought, the, the, the transformation of that agrarian system is something that could be driven by lip, um, development finance that is specifically geared towards um, uh, 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 an adaptation of this social condition that is after all so horrible to, to, to see. So these are four routes that we could consider taking um, with all with merits and demerits, pros and cons, and certainly worth researching and, and, and exploring in greater detail. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, Steph. I think you've certainly helped to elaborate to us all the challenges of of using legal routes to recourse, particularly on the climate change trigger aspects. And I kind of fully appreciate the complexities there. I suppose I'm, I'm tempted to kind of react to several things that people have said. I won't in the interest of time. Um, and I'm very conscious that we're coming towards the end of the session and we still have panelists to, to go. Um, last and not least, um, Marcia, it's delighted, delighted to uh, have you join us. And um, I'm really interested then from you know you are you are engaging in international debates and sessions and negotiations all around the world i just wonder from your perspective and from the climate champions perspective how do you see research like this influencing the kind of evolution of the way our global response to loss and damage um, is shaping up Thank you very much, Tom, and also Ritu Arundati, a researcher's team, and still fellows, panelists for this critical discussion invitation. First, um, I, I do want to share as well um, how strongly it struck me to understand the connections, the compound challenges that such research helps to clarify and elevate, and as well the critical, let's say, need that we have to elevate the reality of the migrant rural women that are suffering the physical and mental health. So I agree from the beginning that uh, with the previous panelists, the intersectionality and systemic changes that this research is exposing. Um, maybe uh, to share the work of the climate champions in regards of the climate action agenda that they are driving, uh, allow me to explain briefly who are you know, what is the mandate of the UN high level champions? Um, who are they and how do they operate and we support them? So to accelerate the delivery of the Paris Agreement and connect the work of governments with the many voluntary and collaborative actions of non-state actors, non-state actors being cities, regions, businesses, financiers, civil society organization, local communities, including women, indigenous groups, etc. The nations decided to appoint two high-level champions. And this year, we have Rasana Mubarak and Nigar Apartarai for COP28 and COP29. So the climate champions recognize that there are urgencies in regards of the responses that we need to have as in their agenda of catalyzing non-state actors. No? The more climate change intensifies, the wider the gender gap grows. We recognize the vulnerability, the urgent need to enhance capacities, respond to increase the resilience of women. Recently at COP28, um, there were processes as well to elevate the voices of women uh, in the climate action and gender responded to just transition, for example. We are recognizing the need to improve the data to better understand the context, the interconnections, ways to unlock finance, accessibility of the finance, but also as well to create decent work opportunities. So the topics of the research comes, especially in that sense, critical to the work that the climate champions are prioritizing. And there are three ways how climate champions and the work of the team and the mobilization of the partners and networks are contributing to help elevate the vulnerabilities and needs of women while advancing solution agendas. 
First, women are at the heart of the global climate action that the high level champions drive in regards of the interlinks of nature and climate action or just transitions, adaptation and resilience and the opportunities to have a people-centered focus with enhancing lives and livelihoods, but as well, equitable finance and the work on elevating the solutions that non-state actors are advancing in regards of loss and damage to inform broader policy opportunities and also ambition from the side of the governments. In regards of adaptation and resilience, the work is cross-cutting in the global climate action and is accelerated mostly by the campaign, Race to Resilience campaign, which aims to increase the resilience of 4 billion people, which are the most vulnerable by 2030. And through that collective action, collective voluntary leadership of non-state actors, working in about 164 countries, targeting the most vulnerable regions of those countries, already there is at least 62% of the partners prioritizing the work with women and girls as key stakeholders. But it's not only about the size of their scope and the solutions being advanced, it's as well the quality of resilience and identifying that it is critical how different effects of climate change might, might require different responses, but in regards of equity. So we wanna see as well the type of quality of that increasing resilience in regards of equity preparedness and planning or learning and empowering, but as well agency, co-creation and access to assets or, or, or information and technology. And on the other hand, there is the Sharma Sheikh adaptation agenda with a set of solutions, really tackling opportunities for addressing systemic ch changes and the transformation needs. I think the previous panelists expressed very well the need for addressing solutions the need to understand the systemic considerations. And yes, I would say we required a multiple set of actions, some that are transformative, that would allow to tackle those systemic roots, but others, especially in regards of the opportunities of the actions that are already being advanced to respond to losses and damage. Some of them with the flexibility, the creativity and the opportunity that allow groups especially the most fragile migrant or the informal sector ones that can have access to those finance. It is not sufficient to have small, let's say small scale uh, advances. We need massive advancements, massive opportunities of those, those access to finance and, and solutions to be deployed. So on one side, um, no, the campaign on race to resilience, bringing in people-centered on the other, the agenda for system transformation and acceleration of adaptation action. But as well, critical is because loss and damage is happening now and the loss and damage fund is taking a, a, a really critical process to be operationalized, is how do we elevate, bring forward those solutions by non-state actors, cities engaging on loss and damage responses, businesses, also humanitarian sector and other actors responding to the immediate challenges that are already facing these groups. So overall, the role of climate action agenda is to elevate the urgency, help understand the challenges, identify the complexity, the differentiation, especially in regards of women and address it from a system perspective because it's critical that we can help elevate the voices and amplify the challenges that are being faced so that we can better also catalyze and help bring the collaboration among the different actors to resolve them and inform how governments in their process for a really critical, I would say, window of opportunity we have with the WE Global Resilient Framework, the enhancements of the NDCs in regards of adaptation and resilience, and as well, the emphasis on lives and livelihoods that needs to be more detailed and enhanced on those processes aligned with the NAP. We, we have a window of opportunity this and next year to bring and inform how these customized local bottom-up following locally led principles are needed 
and can be accelerated because there are solutions that help, because there are approaches and we better understand the situation and the urgency that exists. So in that sense, um, by tackling climate change with a gender lens, we can address women's rights, promote greater gender equality across critical policy processes and uh, enhance opportunities as well to tackle these uh, with the urgency that is needed. Thank well, you. Sia, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, your intervention and also the partnership with you in organizing this session. I'm very much appreciated. We've really been extremely pushed for time with what I know have been such a rich set of, of uh, contributions from panelists and from the the presentation from Ritu. So I'm I, sincere apologies for not being able to have the time to go through our questions and answers live in the session. But I do know that many colleagues around the table have been urgently answering questions in the uh, in, in with with um, text responses. So you will have those. And um, we were also due to have an additional uh, contributor today, Ian Fry. Unfortunately, he's not been able to be with us today. Um, we will we have an, a video from Ian that we will include in the response to the emails that you use to sign up to this session. Um, so there will be an additional uh, rich response for you to review after the session. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of our panelists in in the um, the the generosity of time to be with us today for the session, but also, um, of course, to all of the research team as well, who've put in such time and effort and, and the toll that it's taken on them to come up with what's a hugely valuable study. I think just before we close, I'd love to pass back to Ritu to... Um, to, I suppose, give a call to action um, in terms of what everybody who's joined us today can do next to um, help with addressing some of the, the the significant impacts that have been highlighted here. Ritu, back to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I have, like, I can request uh, Mete to please post the link to the Loss and Damage Research Observatory website. As I'd mentioned earlier, uh, we work very closely with the, the local NGOs, local grounded research organizations, local think tanks. And as you know, even though the way we presented, it might appear that this methodology is quite complex, but we have made sure that it is as simple as possible. It can be replicated in a range of contexts, not just in the case of India's beach region. But when we conducted this, uh, you conducted this research, we were doing it with a view that can we use this methodology in a range of contexts? And we will be coming out uh, with that toolkit so that it can be used in other countries, in other contexts, whether it's to quantify biodiversity loss, loss of quality of life, uh, migration, health, and, and so on. But um, Tom asked me to uh, give a call of action. And uh, what we would really urge you to do is to support us in this loss and damage research observatory. In that research observatory, we want all the practitioners, especially from the Global South, to come together. We want that website to emerge as a repository of all the uh, research in the space. And for that, we will urge you to come and post your blogs, your research papers. This research observatory is not being managed by IAD or ECAD per se, but we want to create a research steering group, which would be governed by the by the actors from the global south and we would be creating a research steering group of about 12 members which essentially would be uh, uh, comprising of the the researchers or the universities from the global south the idea is to have more peer to peer learning but please be on the lookout on that website we will also be launching the salim ullah scholarship where we would be supporting about 25 researchers or organizations from the Global South to conduct these detailed uh, uh, research quantifying both economic and non-economic loss and damage uh, supported by mentors and making sure uh, that we get these evidence not just to influence the national policy and practices but also international discourse uh, and Tom I'll just request you in the end to come for one minute at least to talk about IPCC and how we are supporting uh, research uh, from the Global South come and influence more of uh, the global discourse. Yeah, many thanks, um, Ritu. And so in addition to engaging with the Loss and Damage Research Observatory, IIED now has the, the privilege of hosting the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Professor Jim Ski, um, and uh, particularly 
we are working to support Jim on making sure that the biggest variety of of research and insights and learning from really diverse communities around the world does inform the global policy response through the IPCC. That means that we need to be on the front foot with making sure that we can build studies like this one and many others around the world to a, a level that we can then include within the IPCC report. So we'll be focusing on that in this upcoming IPCC cycle, particularly related to loss and damage research and adaptation research. So there's an added bonus, we hope, of being able to have research featured through the Loss and Damage Observatory is that we will be looking to do our very best to make sure that that can be turned into uh, material that influences the IPCC reports. And so with that, thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate the time today. Thank you again to everybody who's contributed and for all the great questions. And please do uh, amplify the findings of this research through social media, and we would love to engage with you further. So please don't hesitate to get in touch.